Okay, happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Uh, we are in week two. And so I just want to remind you guys, um, the announcements will help keep you on track. Right, so welcome to week two. And also as a reminder, on the syllabus. Just gonna preview it here. All right, week two. So the prep objective was just due this past Sunday at midnight. And then this week, we're working on homework one for chapter one and the quiz for chapter one. Okay, and that'll be due this Sunday at midnight. All right. So we are now officially starting the stats material. And chapter one, we start out on sampling and data. That's what chapter one is about. So first, just to get an idea of what statistics is, um, and there are several different definitions out there. This one's fine. A branch of mathematics dealing with the collection, analysis, interpretation, and presentation of masses of numerical data. Okay, so basically it's the field where we look at, collect, analyze, and interpret all of the stuff with data. Okay, so we live in a very digital age now as well. And so you can imagine masses of data being collected and statistics kind of becoming more at the forefront and more important in business and in organizations and, you know, even in our daily lives. So hence statistics has become a rather popular, you know, subject for college students. Um, all right, so let's just start out looking at this little problem. And and by the way, I'm just going to say it out loud to even help remind me at 1020, we're supposed to have someone from the Math Success Center coming to talk to us. Okay, um, so I got this image from our, our textbook. And it says in your classroom, try this exercise. And this is actually pretty cool. So I want you guys to think about the average time in hours to the nearest half hour that you sleep per night. And actually, I want you guys to type your answer in the chat. And I'm going to create what's called a dot plot of that data. And so the dot plot, it consists of a number line and then dots or points above the number line. You know, so suppose like these were the responses, five hours, five and a half hours, six, 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 blah, blah, blah. So they're listed in order here. And then we plotted these on a dot plot and you see an image for those data. Okay, so I've included a link here for a dot plot maker if you guys are interested like at home. And let's see, I have it up here as well. And I'm going to type in, so me, I'll say maybe five hours. I haven't been doing too good lately. And then you guys, let's see, seven, five. Oops. I had one job. Six. Another six. Another six. A seven. A six, a six point five. So notice as I'm typing how the points get plotted on here. A five and a six and another six. I'm feeling you, oh Nikisha, four. Bless your heart. Six. Nine. Now that's nice, Megan, and I'm jealous. <laughs> Is that everybody? 
That's 15, including me, and there are 24 people here. Okay, seven. I know some of you might be driving or, you know, whatever. Um, but okay, so notice first of all, you know, looking at the data in this column here, in the A column, you know, it's kind of hard to get a feel for, you know, what might be the average or the trend or the lowest or the highest. You know what I'm saying? It, a picture is worth a thousand words, as they say. And so it's kind of nice. Thanks. Oops. What happened? Andy and Alexis. <laughs> So it's kind of nice to have a graph to give us some information. And we can see like right away, six stands out to us as like the most, most popular, right? The least amount was four hours. The greatest amount was nine hours. Uh, but, you know, most of you tend to kind of be right around in here. Uh, you can see the mean. Now, we haven't really learned what any of these words mean yet. So don't worry, this is just a, you know, external dot plot maker that we're looking at. But it does give us the mean, which actually means the average. Okay, so that's the average hours of sleep that we're all getting in this class, just over six. The median, that's one way to tell, um, like the middle. So if I listed all of these in increasing order, you know, that middle number would be six. And then the standard deviation tells us something about how the data vary. And we're gonna be looking at that later. Okay, but so already we, we are doing statistics. And Joseph, thank you. I'm gonna put six in there. So the question was how many hours of sleep do you get on average to the nearest half hour? Um. And then this question says, does your dot plot look the same as or different than this one? What do you guys think? I'm trying to put them, oops, oops. I'm trying to put them kind of side by side. I have way too many windows with them as usual, or too many windows, period. What do you guys think? Same or different? Different because of the different da uh, data? Right, I mean, real technically, they're different because the data is different. Like we can see, for example, there are three dots for seven here and two for seven here, right? The lowest one here is five, the lowest one here is four. So definitely they're not exactly the same. But what about in a more general kind of way? Like if we're looking at kind of the trend, you know, do college students, like how much do college students on average spend sleeping? Then what do you think? Do they look kind of similar? And, you know, the thing is we're so used to in math, like there's one specific answer, you know what I'm saying? Oh, and sorry, Nikisha. Sorry, it's blurry. I wonder why. What about, do, does anybody else see it as blurry or are you guys seeing it clearly? I don't know. It might be on your end or on. Can you guys see this okay? Yeah, we can. I can see it okay. Mm, yeah, maybe Wi-Fi. I don't know if um, you want to try logging back out and you know, back in, I don't know. But anyways, you know, some of the things we're gonna do are going to have specific answers, right? Even like when we graph a line or if you calculate a mean, you know, there's gonna be a single precise correct answer. But oftentimes when we're analyzing and interpreting, there's a lot of kind of gray area. You know, we just want to be able to make sense and justify our reasoning and share 
our thought process. And this is exactly what's done in real life, whether it be in business or, you know, some other sort of like nonprofit organization or whatever, um, you know, just in terms of analyzing. So, you know, like I could make a strong case that these two graphs are very similar. Like they both peak around six. Just letting people in here. Um, you know, so the mean is going to be pretty close, right? We have the same basic kind of shape. You see that? The same basic kind of shape. Look, they both even end at the same. I mean, sure, this one, you know, ends a little smaller, but I mean, it's, it's pretty close, you guys. It's pretty close, right? Um, so, I mean, both answers are fine, but they are, you know, precisely different. And yet, you know, in a more kind of hazy, fuzzy way, they're, they're similar. Okay. So if you did the same example in an English class with the same number of students, do you think the results would be the same? Why or why not? So we're in a math class. If we did this poll in an English class, what do you guys think? And again, you guys, you know, I don't want you to be afraid like, oh, there's just one right answer or whatever. Close that. Does anybody want to take a stab? Let's see, I think it would be the same since the subject of material would probably have no impact. That, you know, that's a perfectly fine answer, right? If we polled an English class, well, it's still a class of college students. What's the difference? They're taking math and English, right? So it would probably be the same thing. That's a perfectly fine, you know, um, conclusion or, you know, kind of theory to throw out there. Um, I could make a case for the exact opposite also. Let's see, I don't think it would since in the class there would possibly be different students. I mean, sure, there are gonna be different students, but, you know, is there any reason why the answers would be different other than, I mean, for sure, every time you, like poll a different group of people, you know, it would be very unlikely to get the same exact responses, you know, twice. That would be very coincidental. But in general, like, do we think English students get more sleep or less sleep than students who are in a math class? You know, that's kind of what we're looking at. And again, I could make an argument for either case. Like I could speculate, you know, I think students in math class are going to sleep less per night. I could speculate that. And my reasoning, well, I think that because, you know, so many students are stressed about math. Uh, there's more homework to do. So they're up late at night doing their homework as opposed to in an English class. They're probably waiting until like their midterm paper is due or something. So they're probably sleeping more soundly. And again, that's just pure speculation. But as long as there's some reasoning behind it that's reasonable, you see what I'm saying? And then you could actually do a study to test what your, your thinking is. You see what I'm saying? So I mean, we're actually doing statistics right now, just talking about all of that. Let's see, I could agree with that as well. Less sleep for math, more sleep for English class. Like I always, you know, what what the first the first image that pops in my head when I see this question, comparing like the math students to the English students. When I was in college, my um now I had a few different roommates, but I had one for a long time and we're still really good friends to this day. Um, and she was a philosophy major and a woman, she ended up 
double majoring in women's studies. And so most of her classes, she had a midterm paper and a final paper. And I was, you know, astrophysics major. I had homework every week, tons of problems, hundreds of formulas to remember and all of this stuff. And I was just, and she seemed so relaxed. So anyways, I'm not saying it wasn't difficult, but <laughs> it was different. It was different. And she was just, she is still super, super smart. Like for me, I wouldn't have been able to remember all of that stuff, you know? So I probably still would have been stressed out studying, trying to remember, you know, different different paradigms, different philosophers, and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. What's the difference between existentialism and postmodernism? You know, like, I would have a hard time with all of that. I remember from my, like, freshman level logic and critical thinking class. Okay, so where do your data appear to cluster? We've already kind of talked about that, right? It seems to cluster around the six, you know? And how might you interpret the clustering? You know, that's the most common response, right? Most commonly students are getting around six hours of sleep per night, which is really unhealthy, you guys. We need more sleep. We need more sleep. Okay, talking for myself again. And honestly, some nights I only get like four hours with my cat. Anyways, okay. And um, if if our presenter from the Mass Success Center is here, please give me a shout out. I don't think I've let in. Okay. Well, there are two branches of statistics. There is descriptive statistics. This is the branch that deals with organizing and summarizing data. Okay, so describing like means and medians and trends and all of that kind of stuff. Summarizing, trying to make sense of, you know, that data. <laughs> Lewis. As long as you're not like an airline pilot or, you know, going to do, get somebody hurt. <laughs> um, all right. And, and then there's inferential statistics. And this is the branch that's used to make estimates, predictions, and to test hypotheses. Okay. So you can see how powerful this is. Right. So like right now, we just collected, organized and summarized some data. So we just did a little descriptive statistics. If, you know, based on just this one little class, we speculate. Right. Like we just said, we think maybe math students in math class are getting less sleep. We could do a study and use that to predict. You know, how many hours of sleep like a student just taking math versus a student just taking English or something, right? And we can test these hypotheses and see um, how, how precise they are, like how good they are. So statistics is really a powerful field. Um, you know, again, kind of the first thing that always pops into my head is like medicine, right? So a new medication is developed and there's a clinical trial where it's given, you know, I know sometimes there's animal testing as a vegan, I really hate that. But clinical trial on people, if it's designed for people and, um, you know, maybe like 90% of people had their headache relieved after an hour from taking this medication. If 90% of the people had that experience, then we can predict that 90% of the population will also have that experience. And then lastly, we're going to be looking at probability, which is involving chance and likelihood that events will happen. I always think of the weather, right? What's the probability it's going to rain or snow up in the mountains and stuff like that? Okay, and we just, I saw, had Rebecca... 
enter, join us from the Mouth Success Center. So are you Hi. ready to give, give the presentation? Yep, I am. Can I share a screen? Yeah, please go ahead. I can't share while you are though. There we go. Mm -hmm. Okay, everyone, I'm Rebecca Rothfelder. I'm here to talk about the Math Success Center and the resources we can offer you this semester to help you succeed in your math class. Um, we, you can see over here is just the homepage of the Long Beach City College and a good way to start to find where you can get all of our resources online is our Canvas page. And you can get there from our website. So if you are on campus, you can see our front doors right through there underneath that awning we have those glass double doors, just walk right in and we can help you in person. We are in B163. Um, you can also contact us through our phone or send us an email. Our hours are nine to seven, Monday through Thursday, nine to three on Friday and 11 to four on Saturday, both in person and online. And this is the Canvas link. So if we click, click that, it's gonna bring you to sign in on your Viking portal. Why don't I stop share for a second, just so I can sign in. Okay, good. Here we are at the Mass Success Center Canvas page. You can also get to our Canvas page from your instructor's Canvas page. Right here on the left-hand side is this list of red links. Somewhere on here is gonna be Math Success Center and that is gonna take you directly to this page. This page also has our hours right here and it starts off by showing you exactly what we can offer you, free tutoring. That's gonna be the most important service we can offer you this semester. You can, If you are on campus, you can walk into our doors and get drop-in tutoring at any time, no appointment necessary. It's about 15 to 20 minutes. Where they answer a question or two, help you get through that hurdle, and then leave you to work on your own for a little bit, and then you can walk, um, walk on up and ask for more help at any time. You can sign up as many times as you need. But I know that a lot of you are online only, so you, we also do have online appointments. This is the link right here for the request form. You click this, and you come here. We're going to need your first and last name, email address that is spelled correctly, active, and you're checking regularly. This is the email address where we would send any appointment confirmation, including the Zoom link, the day and time it's confirmed for, or how we would contact you if we need to make adjustments to the schedule. Your name, your photo, phone number, ID, your course, which is Stat1 Plus, gonna be down here, and your instructor is all the way down here. Tutoring, Zoom, a preferred date and time and an alternate date and time, though, as I mentioned, we may need to adjust um, the appointment um, to accommodate what we have available and when you are available for the appointment. If you need any accommodations, just put that right down here in the comments box, what you need and why you need it, and then we'll try to accommodate you to the best of our abilities. Submit the form and our front counter staff will get on scheduling that as soon as we are open. So if we are not open and you still need immediate tutoring, we have NetTutor available to you. This is also online tutoring. It's available for you through, free through the college. You just click this link here. Tutoring Center. Um, before this, you may get, you have to agree to the licensing agreement for the service. Here, it's just giving you a rundown of their hours. And once you get through that, you would go down to math, statistics, and probability. And then you have the option for drop-in tutoring for an online appointment or to drop off a question and get a comment from one of their tutors on the problem. We also have our free calculator loan program. We don't mail our calculators, so you would have to come in to the center to pick up the calculator. We started those loan, the sign-up sheet on Monday the 6th. That sign-up sheet closed that night and everybody else was diverted to the wait list. And the we, those on the wait list were con contacted yesterday if there was a calculator available for them this week. 
And then starting next Tuesday, the 21st, all calculator loans, graphing and scientific are going to be first come first serve. So if you still need one, that would be the time to come. These are some alternatives that we have. Class Calc and Graphin Calc are both apps you can use on your phone. And Desmos is a graphing site that you can use online. Okay. We also have a resource library. So this is gonna be curated material that you can go through to find um, different topic guides or tutorials. There's also an entire textbook here, an open resource textbook that's gonna go over everything your instructor's going over, maybe going over it in a different way if this is not the textbook your instructor's using. It also has problems to practice and solutions. There's handouts on the different topics and tutorials on similar topics. And these would be the same tutorials that we'd be, we would be going over in the statistics tutorials. So you can print these out and work on your own or wait for a tutorial that you're available for and sign up for that. There's also a TA84 YouTube playlist if you wanna take a look at the different ways you can utilize your graphing calculator. And that brings me to the stat tutorials. So this semester we are running statistics tutorials every week. This week it's going to be Wednesday and Thursday. 4.15 to 5.30 for both of them. The first one is going to be on introductions and definitions. The second one on summarizing and graphing data. Um, the second one is going to be a hybrid tutorial, which means it's going to be both in person and online at the same time. So if you want to come in to do the tutorial, you feel free. But if you can only do online, the first tutorial is online only. And the second one also takes online students. So go ahead and click this link. Here's the form, fill out the information. Again, make sure you're entering in an email address that's spelled correctly and that you're checking because this is the email address where the tutorial information is going to be sent, including the Zoom link and the PDF of the tutorial. If you're on campus, we have our lab area is um, has computers at every table. So if you need to do any online homework, you can come in and do that there. We have a printer and a copier that you can print from one of our computers. It takes only cash, 10 cents a page. And we have study areas if you need something a little bit more quiet. So all of those are the resources that we can offer you this semester. Are there any questions on any of that? Oh, no, thank you. Okay, well then I will leave you to your professor's instructions. Good luck with your guys' this semester. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. All right, you guys, the cat got sick, so I've been running around. Um, oh, okay. So we just finished this and hold on just a second. Okay, sorry. Very sorry, you guys. All right, so we finished kind of the introduction and I'm glad we had to talk about the MSC there. Did you guys have any questions on any of that or? No. Okay, okay. All right, so we're gonna work on 1.1 1 .1 and 1.2 today because there are four sections in chapter one, and then we'll do the other two on Thursday. Um, so in statistics, we generally want to study a population, which is a collection of things under study. So a large population, right? We usually want to know like 
we were talking about like, what do all college students, you know, how much do they sleep? Or maybe all Long Beach City College students. But sometimes it's difficult, expensive, impractical, whatever to actually like poll literally every single student in the entire school or to study every single object in a, a big population. So then we might, we would actually take a sample, okay, which is a subset of a population. And then a parameter is a number that describes some aspect of the population. So, you know, maybe like we did the example, what's the average amount of sleep? So the parameter that we're looking at there is, you know, the average amount of sleep. So our average number of hours, right? Of sleep per night of a college student. So that's what we want to know. And so we take a sample. You know, we're just going to look at so many students. And then the average that we get for the sample is called a statistic. Okay, because it's impractical to do the entire population. You're just looking at a subset or a smaller sample. Um, one way I really help myself to remember this is, you know, the first letters here, right? Parameter is for population and statistic is for sample. They begin with the same letter. So that's pretty helpful. And we need to be able to be clear, right? What's the difference? What is our population? What is our sample? And are we you know, discussing a parameter or a statistic. So these words now are very, very precise. All right. So I've got this worksheet here with some examples. A beverage company wanted to see if people in the United States liked their new logo. Which choice best represents a population? Would it be a selection of logo artists? Every person in the United States. A selection of shoppers from different states or 3,800 children with those from those different age groups. A. So if they wanted to see what all people in oh, the yeah. US think, right then then every person in the US is going to be the population that they're interested in okay um it would be interesting to see you know what a selection of logo artists think but that's a different question right so this is really asking what is the best choice for a pop for the population so the population they're looking at is all people in the United States. And then for number two, a musician wanted to see what people who bought his last album thought about the songs. So a musician has an album, people bought the album, you know, what did they think about his songs? So is the population every person who bought the album, a selection of people who didn't want to buy the album? <laughs> That's clearly not right, B, right? He's studying all the people who bought his last album. So it's going to be A. And it's certainly not 250 girls. So, you know, these might be interesting samples for different reasons or whatever. But the bigger population, uh, oh, sorry, which best represents a sample? Sorry, I should read the question better. <laughs> I thought we were doing population again. 
So the population though is every person who bought the album, right? Now, which choice best represents a sample? What do you guys think? E? So we C? already said A is not because that's the population. So you guys are saying C, 250 girls. That D. is one kind of a sample, right? A selection of people who bought the album. That's way more, like that's a better sample, right? We're not just limiting it to, um, you know, a sample It is going to be kind of a more generic subset of the population. So we wouldn't want to narrow it down to just girls. So I would say D there is the best answer. So just like with the sleep, you know, we wouldn't want a sample of just, you know, female students, unless we were looking at how female students, you know, might sleep. Um, Professor Ward, uh, I did have a question on that because, um, like, I suppose like that's not very uh, clear to me as to how, uh, like some can be samples and then, but they're not as like good representations of them. So um, like, for example, like uh, like how we, some of the students, like how we put C because we've seen it as a sample. Um, how does that like not, or how would that not be uh, I guess, a correct uh, answer? Yeah, correct answer, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I get totally what you're saying. And let me just say, this is just a worksheet that I got online. Um, it's actually a very credible source. And these worksheets are used, you know, oftentimes in K through 12, where these ideas are also taught. Um, but I mean, your question is very valid. You know, I think they ought to have phrased it a little better, but they do say best. But I think they ought to say which choice represents the best sample. You know, I think they ought to put the best over here myself. But that that is their intention here. Like what would be the best sample? He wants to know what all people who bought his last album thought. So would you rather just ask 250 girls or would you rather ask over 3000 people in general, right? Like it makes sense when you think of it that way, that D is a better, you know, it's the best sample to answer his question. So does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Okay, and then Alex, we're gonna see, it's gonna be much more clear. Uh, Lewis. So the reason it wasn't A, because it says every person who bought the album, and it kind of answers the question, is D because it gave a number of how many people have bought the album versus saying every person who bought the album? Is it like wordplay is the difference in this? So every person who bought the album, that is the population. That is the population. If you're going to study what everyone, you know, if you want to study everyone who bought the album to see what they thought, that's the population that you're interested in. But it's going to be difficult. What if, what if this dude sold like millions of albums? It's going to be probably difficult to track down all those people to see what they thought. But every person who bought the album, that's called the population that's being studied. And so the question is about the sample. So again, if he sold like millions of copies of an album, it would be really difficult. So he's going to look at a sample of everyone who bought the album instead. Okay, I see, because the 3,200 represents percentage of the people. Okay, I understand. Okay. 
Yeah. 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 I, I'm sorry if that, and, and, you know, of course I started us off wrong, but by, by mistakenly thinking they were asking about the population. So I can see now in this column, they're asking about samples in this column, they're asking about populations. And by the way, the answers are here as well. Um, and, you know, I know they're saying which best represents, which best represents, you know. So we're just trying to get the idea of a big population being studied versus a sample that's going to give us an indication what's going on in that population. So like three, a gaming website wanted to find out which console its visitors owned. So which choice best represents a population? So, right, and so we can see the answer there is B as well, but that's good, right? So they want to find out which console its visitors owned. Right. So that's every single visitor to that website. That's what they're trying to figure out. That's the population. OK. And then over here, I want to be careful again. We're looking for samples. Before a nationwide election, a polling place was trying to see who would win. Which best choice best represents a sample. So a selection of, you know, so again, like we don't want to try to narrow down when we're taking a sample, we want it to be representative of the greater population. Um, so we don't just want a selection of voters over age 50. We don't just want male voters. It'd be great to have a selection of voters from all different ages, right? That would be a nice like cross section. So we're getting a sense of everyone in that entire population. Is this helping a little bit? Because this right now, I'm just trying to really emphasize understanding, you know, the difference between a population and a sample. And again, we're going to look at the, the actual Alex questions in a bit. I think it definitely helped that you clarified um, that in a sample, what we're looking for is um, like a selection of everyone. Um, yeah, that definitely helps. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, that's gonna come up in the next section, I think. Um, but yes, a sample should be representative of the population, right? So if I wanna know something about all Long Beach City College students, I don't wanna just look at, you know, college students who are the, you know, like 18 to 20. I don't want to just look at college students at Long Beach City College who are veterans. I don't want to just look at female college students, you know, because that's not going to be representative of the entire student body. So we always want a sample to be representative of the greater population. All right. So next up, again, these kind of key terms. Just see. So you have six. Um, a variable, usually notated with an X or a Y, like we see in algebra, it's a characteristic or a measurement of each member of a population. So again, maybe the variable is, you know, the average hours of sleep that someone gets per night, or um, maybe it's, you know, how much they liked the album that they bought, you know, like hate it, it's okay, love it, you know, whatever. Maybe there's some category or something. 
And so we see that there are two types of variables. There are quantitative and qualitative or numerical and categorical. So basically variables that have numbers, like the number of hours that you slept, right? And then variables that are put where the data is put into categories. So like gender or month or, you know, what building on campus or whatever, hair color. Okay, so this is all qualitative data and then quantitative data or numerical has numbers. So does that make sense? And I'm trying to have it to, you know, like numerical, like the NUM really, it's that same root, right? Or quantity, right? Or quality. Okay. Okay, Keisha, so can you see okay now? Yes, I can now, thank you. Okay, why is it doing that? Got too many password managers. <laughs> All right, so we're going to look at the homework for chapter one. And starting off, we're just looking at problems one through four here. Okay, so differentiating between parameters and statistics. All right, Amy is a stats keeper for the local youth soccer league. At the end of the season, she calculated the average number of passes completed in a game for a random group of 35 players to be 16 and a half passes, pass accuracy 55%, blah, 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 blah. In contrast, the average number of passes completed in a game for all players in the league was blah, 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 blah. Okay, so does it make sense that all players in the league, that's the population? I'll try to use the same color that I had. I had blue for population and purple for a sample, right? So Amy has a random group of 35 players. That's a sample. And then all of the numbers associated with that sample are statistics, and all of the numbers associated with the population are parameters. So it says for Amy's group, identify the population and the sample. So the population, it's all players in the league. The sample, it's just the random group. So notice there's no other choices, right? And then the 67% pass accuracy among all players in the league. So that's a parameter. And then the 17 left-footed players among the random group of 35. So that's a statistic describing that sample. And the last one, the average number of passes in a game amongst all the players, right? So that's a parameter. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
And Lewis, did you still have a question or you just still have your hand up from last time? You, do you know how to put your hand back down? Lower it, I guess they call it. Okay, yeah. All right, cool. And thanks for the reactions, people giving thumbs up and all right. And we'll just look at the explanation in here too. So you guys have access to all of this explanation. It gives you a lot of, you know, background and discussion about population parameter. Notice they've italicized some of the keywords there, sample and statistic. And so they explain all of that and then summarize the answer down here, which is really nice. Alex is the bomb, I think, you guys. Okay, the records for all trains scheduled to depart from the concert hall train station last year showed that the average delay for the trains was 13.1 minutes, blah, blah, blah. Amy is a traffic engineer. Wait a minute, wasn't she also doing the soccer league? <laughs> or is that somebody else? She's a traffic engineer helping the concert hall station improve its performance. So she audited a random group of 70 records of trains. In her group, she found all of this stuff. Okay, so, you know, all the trains, that's the population. And all of those numbers associated with that are parameters. And then she audited a random group of 70. That's the sample. And all the other numbers are statistics that relate to that. So is this like really good? Like tell the truth. Population, all the trains, the sample, just the record of 70. Right, and this is very real world stuff. She wants to help improve the performance. So she's gonna look at, you know, maybe where there are problems. All right, so 18.6% of all trains, right? So that's a parameter. 12 canceled trains among all trains. That's a parameter. And the 22 and a half minute average delay, right? That was among the random group. So that's a statistic. And then looking at how to classify these variables. So is the variable a number or a category, right? Quantitative or qualitative? Or quantitative or categorical? So I know there's a lot of kind of words there, but again, you know, these are really just English words that have the same you know, layman meaning as they do here precisely in statistics. That's not always the case in math, but it is here. So temperature in degrees Celsius, that's going to be a number, right? How hot or cold it is. I was going to say cold right away because it's kind of cold out for me. Right, the amount in pounds of weight needed to break a bridge cable. So that's going to be a number of pounds. Marital status, that's a category. Number of seconds playing a DVD. Okay.
All right, so what do you guys think for A, B, C, D? And you can just put Q or C in the chat if you want. Yep, so your favorite game show, that's going to be a category. Maybe you're doing a multiple choice and if you were listed or whatever. A university that a student is enrolled in. And that's also going to be categories, right? Like, is it a UC or a CSU or, you know, out of state? Those are three categories. About closing price in dollars of a stock. Yep. That's the quantity, the number of dollars. And then distance and miles from home to the nearest all night convenience store. Yeah. Number of miles, right? Okay. So these are okay, easy schmeasy, easy schmeasy. Good. So let's look at uh, 1.2. So this is on data sampling and variation in data and sampling. So most data can be put into these categories, the qualitative or categorical, the quantitative or numerical. Now for the numerical, when you're dealing with numbers, those numbers could be discrete or continuous. All right, so discrete is when the values are distinct and separate, like for counting, right? Like how many books do you own? You're not gonna have like 10 and a half books probably, right? You're gonna have 10 or 11, they're discrete. Whereas like time is an example of something that's continuous, right? How much time did it take to read a book? It's, you know, you don't jump from like eight hours to nine hours. It's maybe eight hours, so many minutes, so many seconds, so many fractions of a second, depends on how precise you wanna get. Right. So um, data is said to be continuous if the values can take on any value in an interval. And, um, you know, these are just little graphs to help picture, you know, like some examples of discrete data, like age, right? So you're looking at maybe just your age in years. Okay, what's your age in years? And, you know, you're 20 or 21 or 50 or 51, et cetera. Um, how many tickets were sold for some event, right? Notice there are individual distinct dots, right? Maybe 10,000 or 11,000 or, oh, the price, whatever, but... Um, you know, I still think in number of tickets. So maybe if you buy more tickets and the cost should actually come down, but I, I guess the whole lump sum of them, the cost will be more. Um, so customer, uh, number of customers and the samples that they got, um, the months, right, and how much money you've saved. So these are all examples looking on the, um, you know, the along the x-axis, we're looking at discrete data. And here, we're looking at continuous data. So how much something costs, you know, in pounds. And again, 
you know, when you're weighing something, it's not going to be exactly like one pound, two pounds. There's going to be some fraction in there. It's continuous. There are no gaps. Um, and we talked about time being continuous. Um, you know, here we have age and height. And here you could also look at that continuous height. So maybe you're looking at like the height of a newborn baby. Usually we talk about length when it's a newborn. But, you know, and then as they grow, it's a continuous process. There's not really those kinds of growth spurts that happen instantaneously. And um, time is a very common one. Okay. So there are some common ways to represent categorical data. So these are where you have the individual categories. It's qualitative data. Um, commonly, we use a bar graph, right? So here we're looking at, you know, maybe you've surveyed like a high school class and how did they get to school, right? Seven took the bus, eight went by car and 12 walked to school. And so this is a nice display of the data you could also use a circle graph, sometimes also called a pie chart. And this is just a different way to represent that same data. You know, so this is giving a percent of the whole. So 30% of the class went by car and 44% walked. Right. So they give different kinds of information and a little different view. I'm sure we've all seen both bar graphs and circle graphs in our lifetimes. Um, here's a bar graph with the unknown other category. And so ethnicity of students, right? 36.1% Asian, 5.8% Black. 5.3% Filipino, et cetera, et cetera. And here we have what's known as a Pareto chart. And so it is a type of bar graph where these bars are sorted by, by size, right? So it's a type of chart that consists of bars. So it is a bar chart where they're sorted by size from largest to smallest. So this makes it easy for your comparisons. Okay, so all of this is with categorical data or qualitative data. For measurement data, some common types of graphs would be a histogram that's a bar graph with a frequency distribution. So oftentimes you'll see these showing, you know, like a grade dis distribution for say an exam, like the number of people who got a B, the number of people who got an A, you know, so maybe this is like 90 to 100, right? This is 80. So like this many people got a B, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. This many people got an A. Right, a time series graph. So this is a line graph. You know, basically they're kind of these points plotted, and then you connect the dots. So, you know, I don't know. And my first thought was like, how much money do I have in the bank? Like during the month. <laughs> Right. You start off with this much, you spend money on your rent or mortgage or whatever. You don't have very much. And then who like the fifth of the month comes and you get a paycheck <laughs> and then you start spending again. I don't know. That's one th way. Or, you know, whatever. I, I often think of the X axis. Right. as being like number of hours in a day or whatever. And so something that has transpired. Maybe you're driving, I don't know. 
And then this last one here, it's called a stem and leaf plot. And if you've never seen one of these before, you know, the stem represents the first two digits of a number. And then each leaf represents the last digit. So maybe we're looking at like, how many days has it been since you've been on vacation, right? It's close to the end of the year. So for one person, it's been 330 days. Another person also, it was 330 days. For someone, it was 331. See how the one is the leaf added onto that stem. And for one person, 337 days. And then with the next stem, for one person, it's been 340 days. For another person, 341. In fact, for two people, right, 341. And then for one person, 342. And so again, like looking at the stem and leaf plot, it's just a very organized, nice view to see quickly, um, you know, how the data kind of unfold, if you will. Um, you know, this, it's hard for my eyes to make sense of, even though it's in numerical order. But here we see, like, there were five people in the 330s and four people in the 340s. The least was 330, the highest was 342, you know? And if you turn that on its side, um, you know, it starts to look like a histogram, right? Because you can see there were more in the 330s. Okay. And here we go, what we were talking about last time. A sample should have the same characteristics as the population it's representing. Okay. So a random sample is one in which every member of the given population has an equal chance of being selected for the sample. All right. Every single member has an equal chance of being selected for the sample. So one sampling method, it's called a simple random sample. And that's one in which every possible sample has an equal chance of being selected. There are various ways of obtaining this, like drawing names from a hat. That's the classic kind of explanation. What's a simple random sample? It's like, you know, I'm going to give everyone a student ID number like we have here at Long Beach City College. And, you know, I'm going to write on a little slip of paper every, you know, one student number on a piece of paper and put it in a hat. So there's one piece for every single student. I think we have over 40,000 students. So it's going to be a gigantic hat. And then I'm going to draw a piece of paper, draw another piece of paper. Maybe I want a random sample of like 50 students. I would draw 50 pieces of paper. Um, now with computers, it's usually easier to generate a random number. And we're gonna look at that from this link and also how to do it on a calculator. Um, other ways are, you know, using dice, using a spinner. So you could imagine, um, you know, and I, I often think about like maybe in an elementary school classroom or like you have a group of kids, maybe you have six kids and you could roll a die and, you know, each kid is like given a label one through six and you could roll a die and it's very random which number it's going to land on and that will select which child. Of course, you know, you've got to have these um, these multiples of six, two dice, 36. But there are other kinds of um, 
what do they call them? Number pieces. There's a name for it um, with different number of sides. And similarly with the spinner, right? You can spin it and it lands on maybe a color or something like that. But so now, like I was saying, you know, we have computer generated ways to go about, um, especially say generating random numbers, a random number generator. So let's look at random.org. And there's all kinds of stuff. Um, if you're interested in playing around, it even has a dice roller. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, but I want to look at just the integer generator. All right, so maybe student ID numbers, you know, only have, I don't know, three, three numbers. So for some reason, um, Oh, I see. Okay. Each integer should have a value between one and, so you can make this whatever you want up to, um, what is that? A billion. So maybe here, I don't know how many digits the student ID numbers are, but let's just say from one to a thousand. And I want to pick maybe 50 different students. Okay. And I'm going to format in you know, how many columns, five columns of 10 numbers to get me 50, right? And then get numbers, and there you go. Got five columns, and these are just randomly generated numbers between one and 10,000. So very simple. Do it again and get a whole different group of numbers. And I remember when I first started kind of learning some of this, I thought I could just randomly make up numbers, but yeah, we can't, we really can't. We need a, you know, a different way to truly randomly generate these things. And then also using a TI-83 or 84 calculator, and I have one here. Here are steps to generate a random integer. So press the math button. And I know some of you guys have loaned calculators. Some of you bought calculators. Some of you just have calculators. You don't need them, okay? I'm just showing you like how powerful it is to have, you know, a calculator, a handheld. Arrow over to PRB. So you're gonna use these arrow keys and arrow over. And PRB stands for probability. And then you can either scroll down to five or press five, right? So you can arrow down or you can enter the number five and see that's random integer. And this is suggesting to do zero comma 30 and close the parentheses. And this will generate a random integer between zero and 30. And you can keep doing it by pressing enter. So again, that's really cool. Really, really cool. Uh, notice if you add a comma three in there, it'll automatically give you three of them. So choose the PRB and then choose the random integer. So you could do between zero, how about between zero and a hundred? And I want to pick like five numbers. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. 
And there's the closing parentheses, parentheses there. So this is all good. You can do it again. There are five random integers between zero and 100. All right, so this is probably a good time to take a break. Um, let's take a break and we'll come back at 1130, okay? Hey, okay, welcome back everybody. Okay. All right. So next up, we're talking about different sampling techniques. And um, these are some common ones. Um, random sampling, stratified sampling, systematic sampling, and cluster sampling. So we've already looked at the simple random sampling. Um, so as long as we're making sure that, you know, every object or person is equally likely to be selected from the population and, um, yeah, then that's a, just a random sample, like drawing names from a hat. Okay. Stratified sampling. This is where first we take the population and break it into different groups. And then we're gonna choose some objects or people from each group. So for example, let just grab a pen. So for example, you know, you're looking at a high school and you want to know something, you know, you're going to pull to learn about all of the high school student body, right? But there are a lot of students at your high school, so you can't really pull everyone. But you want to make sure you get like a good kind of cross section. So maybe you're going to get like 25 freshmen, 25 sophomores. 25 juniors and 25 seniors. Okay, so that'll be a good representation of the student body. So we have stratified the population into these four different groups. And then we've taken a random sample from each one of those four groups. How does that feel, you guys? Um. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, just to kind of clarify you're dividing the population into um like subgroups and then you're taking the sampling is um like you're taking um samples from those subgroups yeah okay thank you mm -hmm. so I divide into groups or strata. And then take a sample from each group. Okay. 
Okay. And then systematic sampling is where you do the nth observation of your population. So for example, um, so this is very systematic, okay? Very systematic. Um, maybe you want to know what students at a dorm think about the new cafeteria, okay? And there are, you know, thousands of students living in this dorm. So you can't really ask every single person. You don't want to just ask people maybe on the bottom floor. It, you know, there could be all kinds of reasons for this, but we want to just do a good kind of sampling method to make sure we're getting a random sample that's going to represent our, our population. And so um, you could say, I'm going to knock on like every fifth door, right? That's the nth, you know, or every 10th door. And then ask the students who live in that dorm room what they think. Um, another example, just letting students in still. And apologies if, you know, students who come in late, which is totally fine. And I know sometimes too, you have some internet connection problem and you get bounced out and then you have to come back in later than the start of class. But um, just so you know, sometimes I don't see you while I'm lecturing and you're stuck in the waiting room for a little bit. And I, I apologize for that, but I do my best. It's hard to monitor. Um, so another example for systematic sampling, um, and this is very real world practical as well. Like maybe in a warehouse, there is, um, let me just see what this chat is. Oh, no worries. Um, so, you know, it's it's a warehouse that manufactures, um, I don't know, uh, graphing calculators. <laughs> and, um, well, that's gonna be hard for this example. How, how about, there was an example that I saw yesterday um, where there was a warehouse that had like rolls of plastic. And each roll of plastic that's being sold, it's supposed to be like 30 feet long. Okay, now you know that it's it's kind of impossible to be a, that exact, right? So there's some plus or minus. Oh, another good example might be weight. You know, like when you buy cereal and it's supposed to be like, you know, approximately however many ounces. Like this, this is a box that's like 32 ounces of cereal. But if you weigh it, it might be like 32.1, it might be 31.9, you know, it's going to be close, but it probably won't be smack on. So there are people who do quality control. So, hold on just a second. So someone from quality control, they they come and they're going to make sure that the boxes are being filled to, you know, close to 32 ounces, plus or minus whatever their error of measurement is. Or they want to make sure that the rolls of plastic are, you know, 30 feet, plus or minus a couple of inches isn't bad, but they don't want one going out that's only like 28 feet or something, right? And so, you know, rather than looking at thousands and thousands of rolls or thousands and thousands of boxes, they might look at like, you know, every 10th one or something. Okay, so that's systematic sampling. And then we have cluster sampling. Cluster sampling. Um, so this is where we 
pick a random cluster <laughs> like group and then study everything in that group. So um, you do a different color. So choose random groups. And then study all in those groups. Sunshine. It's okay how mommy's going to get that, okay? Sweetheart. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, um, this is cluster sampling. And oftentimes people do confuse cluster sampling with stratified sampling. This was the stratified up here. So an example, um, suppose, try to get my creative hat on. Um, <laughs> I always come up with these Taco Bell examples. So suppose you're interested in, you know, surveying Taco Bell employees to see like what they think about the new security system in the state of California. Okay, so the population, all Taco Bell employees in the state of California. Um, so you want to pick maybe, you know, two restaurants in Northern California. Maybe two in Central California. And two in Southern California. And then you're going to ask the questions of everyone in those restaurants, all the employees in those restaurants. So the restaurants are the clusters. Um, and maybe two isn't enough, but I'm just, you know, totally making something up here. So does that make sense? And we're going to look at some examples in Alex. And I'm going to take a picture of this. In case we want to see it later. And it's interesting to see some of the pros and cons of these method methods. And I've just kind of included that. You're not going to be tested on that. But, um, and, you know, I don't remember if I mentioned this on the first day of class or not, but, you know, this really is an, an introduction to statistics. And it's great to have kind of, you know, that introductory understanding, you know, get some insight into how these things work. Um, be able to follow along and even be like a good consumer, to be a good like patient, you know, all of these kinds of things to have some understanding of probability and statistics. In real life, though, when a study is being done, there is going to be someone who's very much an expert at, at studying <laughs> whatever it is. It's a very advanced field when it comes, you know, in practice. Okay. So, um, you know, kind of a simple study at the end of this class, you ought to be able to do. But, um, you know, in general, to do like a real study for like a large organization or something. I mean, there, there's going to be probably a team of researchers doing, you know, these kinds of analyses. So there's a whole lot to going on in the background. And then, yeah, there's also convenient sampling. 
So convenient sampling is probably like the worst in terms of introducing bias into your study. Uh, but sometimes, you know, like that's all you, you've got available to you for whatever reason. But anyways, um, so basically respondents or um, depending on, you know, what you're studying, like the, I'm just going to look at the first trees at this edge of the forest because, I you know, I don't have time to go deeper in the forest or whatever. Um, I'm just going to be interviewing people on the street. You, we've all seen this like on the news and asking people, you know, what do they think about something? And so that's not representative of a true population of all people, right? They just happen to be there. Like, um, you know, you're standing in front of a Harley Davidson shop and you're going to ask people, hey, what do you what do you think about motorcycles? <laughs> The people there are probably going to love them, right? They're going to be more likely to love motorcycles than maybe the general population. Okay. Um, you know, so intercepting people walking into a mall, right? That's another one, right? I mean, a lot of people would never even go to a mall. So again, it depends on, you know, what you're looking for. Um, but this is, you know, oftentimes not a good method of sampling. And so again, hopefully this will kind of twang your radar if, if you hear somebody did a research study and, and people always explain the method that they took, you know, they ought to. And so this ought to cause some concern if you see that, okay? Uh, or maybe, yeah, like the only people I could get to participate in my study were students because they had more free time or something, right? <laughs> and I think too about like jury duty, right? It's supposed to be a good cross section of our population. Like, and students maybe have a more flexible schedule than someone who works Monday through Friday, like eight to five or something. But, you know, even they don't do that. They don't pick like just students. Okay, and then variation is something that's present in any set of data. You know, it talks about how the data varies and sampling vari variability is how much an estimate varies between samples. So like we saw, you know, in our class this morning, the average number of hours of sleep that we're getting is something like six and a half hours, I think it was, right? But if we sampled another math class, maybe my one of my other math classes even, you know, it might be seven hours or it might be 5.8 hours, right? I mean, there's gonna be some variability. Okay, so let's continue on here with our homework, five through 12. So discrete versus continuous. All right, so the total sm uh, snowfall amount in Minneapolis. What do you guys think? Discrete or continuous? Now, sometimes too, I think, you know, normally we kind of hear on the news like they round it up to the nearest inch, but really, it, you know, it's going to be continuous. Um, you know, it's going to, because you're measuring some height and it's not going to jump between four inches and five inches. It might be four and a half, four and three quarters, you know. So, and you guys, I wouldn't, you know, if you get one of these kinds of questions wrong, as we move along, we're going to be doing way more precise, like formula type stuff. If you get some of these wrong, you know, I would kind of take it with a grain of salt and just see what they meant and read, you know, you could do the homework unlimited number of times until you get them right. So, um, as long as you're understanding the difference, 
you know, I'm more interested in understanding. Um, you know, again, the interest rate charged by a local bank. So oftentimes they round it to the nearest percent, but I mean, I don't know, I hear like 2.1% or 3.5, I don't know. They usually round it to some decimal place. So I'll be interested too to see if they say discrete, but you know, technically it should be continuous. Same with the body weight of a child, right? It's not gonna be smack on a pound or whatever. Now here, the number of students out of 35 who improve their score, right? That's gonna be some number one to 35. So that should be discrete. Okay, so got that one right. <laughs> But again, I'm just saying, like, I could see how you would be tempted, like, on the internet interest rate, you know, and the snowfall and stuff to want to round it, but it's continuous. Let's see the explanation in here. Yeah, the total snowfall could be any number on an interval of numbers, like 50.62 inches or 63.47 inches, whatever. And then same with, you know, an interest rate, it could be 7.030 or 7.29 or blah, 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 blah. Right. Whereas here, you know, the number of students, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it'd actually be between zero and 35 instead of one and 35. Okay. All right. In a reaction time study involving 12 participants, the number of participants whose average time, blah, blah, blah. So here we're looking at the number of those 12. So that's going to be a discrete number between 0 and 12. The fuel efficiency in miles per gallon of an American-made car. Again, normally, car dealerships, you know, they round up. Like, yeah, this car gets 26 miles per gallon. But in real life, you know, it could be 26.378 or whatever. Um, the number of insects feeding on a tree leaf. So these are live insects. We're not going to be dealing with any halves or anything. The actual length of a roll of plastic. Right, so that's continuous. Because it could really be anything. 29 point seven, eight, three, or whatever feet. Is this I'm a point. I'm a point. on the um the leaf? Yeah. Is it because it's animals, uh, insects of, of such? Is that why it's discrete and not continuously? Yeah, because we're just saying, like, how many insects? Are there 10? Are there 12? But it's not going to be some number between 10 and 12, like, or between, say, 10 and 11. There are, you know, on a number line, there are literally infinitely many numbers between 10 and 11. Infinitely many. Because there's... 10.0000000001. Infinitely many, right? 10.5, 10.51, 10.52, 10.53. Ten point five three three, point five three three six, point five three three six eight, 
there are infinitely many numbers. But when you're talking about some being, a person or an animal or an insect, you're talking about these whole numbers. So these are discrete. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. Okay. All right. And then choosing units of measurement and also an appropriate method to gather data. Michael wants to find the average time it takes Northside High School students to run a lap around the track. So he will consider a sample of students to find the average time. So he's looking at time. What would be um, an appropriate unit of measurement? So you wouldn't measure time in kilograms yeah. or grams, but you could use seconds, minutes, and hours. Right, kilograms or grams, those are units of mass. Hours, minutes, and seconds are units of time. And now which of the procedures would be the best way to find the average time? So should you ask for volunteers to run a lap and then they'll tell you their time. Like I see two problems with that. <laughs> the first one is, you know, when you ask for volunteers, they're probably gonna be like on the track team, like me. Although I was not good at the 400, which is one lap. I was a sprinter and I sprinted like the 100, 200. But, um, you know, the volunteers might be fat. He wants to know out of the whole school, And then you don't want people to give you, you know, their times. You want to time them, right? So still, I would say it's just, it, you know, if you can get away from it, it's better to not have volunteers. Hey, randomly picking 32 students and measuring their time. That's really good. Right here, you've randomly picked, but you've asked them to state their own times. That's not very precise, right? Imagine running and trying to like count or, okay, I'm going to start my watch or something, you know. So does it make sense that that's the best answer? Okay. All right, Kiko wants to find the average height of students in the 11th grade. She's going to use the heights of 50 students to find the average height. How should she collect those and what units should she use? So which units could be used? Okay, so we're not looking for best, but what, what's possible to measure height. So you could measure height in meters or centimeters. All right, again, grams, milligrams, and kilograms are for mass. And then what is the best way for her to find these 50 students? And again, I do not recommend volunteers volunteers, or stating their own heights. So this one, randomly selecting the 50 students, names out of a hat, random number generator, out of all the student IDs or whatever. Okay.
Maybe one more. Let's see if there's a different type of scenario. These are all like choosing people in high school. Is that just, okay. A scientist wants to find the average mass of fish living in a large pond. So she'll use the masses of 25 fish from the pond to find the average mass. Which units could be used for measurement? So centimeters and meters are for length or distance. Mass is measured in kilograms, grams. You could also have pounds. Pounds is actually weight. So mass is in uh, grams or kilograms. And then, you know, randomly picking those 25 is good. And then you don't want to really just estimate, you want to weigh them, right? We certainly don't want to pick fish only from the shallow region. Because imagine bigger fish probably aren't going to be able to survive in that shallow water, right? So, yeah, this is, you know, those are bad. Randomly picking them and weighing them. Okay. All right, choosing an appropriate method to conduct a survey and then making an estimation. East High wants to estimate the number of students who drive to school. So which of the following surveys probably would best represent the entire student population? So let's see, they all start out with you know, the first thing I notice is 50 students are randomly selected. So that's good. And we, you know, the whole population is, you know, all the student, the entire student population, right? That's the population. So we don't want to just pick from the science club. We don't want to just pick from the seniors, right? We want to pick from the entire school. Does that make sense? You know, if you pick from the 12th grade, you're going to probably get more people driving, right? They're older. I don't know what you could say about the science club, but... You know, sometimes we tend to be nerds and maybe we're more focused on science than we are on getting our driver's license in high school or something like that. I'll tell you what, though, the first day I was eligible, I was at the DMV getting <laughs> driver's license. But um, so I'm going to say that. OK, so 11 students out of 50. 11 out of 50. So thinking about like fractions, right? Like suppose you have like a pizza cut into, you know, eight slices. Oops. Like eight slices of pizza. And if you had three of them, you would have had three eighths of the pizza, right? So here, 11 of the 50 students selected drove to school. So you have 11 out of the 50. I wonder what percent that is. Percent means per 100. Per cent. 
per 100, just like there are 100 cents in a dollar. So if I only had 100 on the bottom, then I would know how many per cent. I could multiply the bottom by two to get 100 on the bottom. So I would have to multiply the top by two also so that I'm multiplying by a fraction that equals one. Two over two is one. So that's 22 hundredths or 22% point two two because that's twenty two hundredths. Now you can also certainly do this on your calculator. Eleven divided by fifty. Notice the divided by key. You know, automatically writes it as a fraction as a fraction. And it also gives you point two two. It's 22%. So again, you can always use your calculator. At the same time, I just want to point out, when you have a denominator like 50 or 25 or 20, something that's easy to get, you know, by multiplying something easy to get the 100 on the bottom, people generally do these calculations in their head. And so again, I just feel like if you're in a meeting and you're talking with people, oh yeah, so 11 of those 50 vehicles broke down in the last five years. Most people in that meeting, I want to say everyone, will be thinking to themselves that's 22% because they can just do it in their head. And it's useful to be able to do that, to you know understand so someone says, well, we're trying to keep the number under 25%. So you want to know that that was under 25% without, oh, hold on, let me pull out my calculator. Letting everyone know you couldn't do that in your head, you know, especially where there's a lot of conversation going on. I'm just, I want to give you guys motivation for learning some of this basic math. It's really basic math. Right. This kind of math is done in like fourth or fifth grade. So any kind of really high paying job, you're probably going to have some kind of math involved and you're probably going to want to know how to do this. If you're supervising people, you know, they are probably going to know how to do it. And, you know, I, I just want to motivate you to want to do it. Because then you'll do it to stick with you and not just like, okay, I have to do it on the test. You don't have to do this on the test. You could use a calculator. But I care about you guys. <laughs> and it's worth knowing. All right. So 22% of the school drives. So if there are 1,650 students in the entire school, what is 22% of 1650? So of means multiplication. So I already have the 0 0.22 and then of 1650. 363, okay? So 363 students drove to school. Let's do another one. Uh, a different scenario then. All right, a political campaign wants to estimate the number of adult residents who voted in the last election. So which surveys would best represent the entire adult population? The entire adult population. So, you know, we don't want to just 
look at seniors or just homeowners, right? The entire population of the city. So 50 adult residents are randomly selected and 25 voted. So what percent is that? 25 out of 50, I mean, that's half, right? Or 50%. And so 50% of 22,900 is 11,450. 50% is how? So that's the quick way, my friends. If you used your calculator, right, you do 25 divided by 50. That's 0. 0.5, and then times the 22,900. 11,450. Okay. And there's just one topic left here, classifying samples. Right, so here we're looking for stratified. So this is where we break into groups and get a sample from each group. So counselors at a college went to poll students about how much time the students been studying, which best describes a stratified sample? So it's not every sixth student, right? Um, students living in a particular dorm are easily accessible. Nope. So that's volunteer. That's, um, the word escapes me, systematic. Systematic sampling. So the counselors form five groups of students based on the number of classes they're taking, and then they take 12 students at random from each group. So that's a stratified sample. Okay. And then the next one is a convenient sample. The organizers of a conference want to survey attendees about the registration fee, which of the following best describes a convenient sample? The organizers form groups of 10, blah, 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 no. They select the first 50 who register and they're easily accessible, right? That's convenient, my, my friends. A facility supervisor wants to rate the condition of the seats in the stadium, which of the following best describes a cluster sample? So now you're gonna take some number of clusters and look at all of the seats in those clusters. So the supervisor forms groups of nine seats based on the selections and then selects all of the seats in six randomly chosen groups, okay? So that is a cluster. Rather than every sixth seat, right, that's uh, systematic. And here she's choosing seats from each group, but it's all within the chosen groups. So let me put another one up here and you guys think about these. And if you want to type in the chat, you could give me your answer for A, B, and C all together in the chat. And Keisha, I'm sorry, I just saw your um, chat question. Did I already answer that for you? Hopefully?
And so you could just type like A, one, two, or three, B, one, two, or three, C, one, two, or three. I know there's a lot to read in these. <laughs> I feel like it kind of gets easier the more, you know, you see a few, it's like, okay, you know, it's in italics, easily acceptable, like the first, you know, the kind of keywords really help too. And then I'd still read it carefully, but. Yep, you guys are getting them all right. Which warms the cockles of my heart. <laughs> Especially on Valentine's Day. And I want to show the explanation to... So they actually do a good job here too. This is new um, of explaining those and then explaining why. They've done each one. Okay, Doka. So you guys, I say we leave a few minutes early today. I want you guys to hopefully have a wonderful Valentine's Day and I will see you on Thursday, okay? Feel free to stay if you have any questions for me. Okay, thank you. Bye.